to not new in office Prabowo Subianto takes oath as Indonesia's president and swears the new cabinet which is the largest in decades Cuban power crisis Cuba's electrical grid collapses leaving the country in a nationwide blackout while Hurricane Oscar raises fresh doubts on a quick fix in distant shadows Dozens killed and missing in Israeli attack in northern Gaza after Israel vows to strike Hezbollah's financial sites. And inspiring sounds. An award-winning musician scores unusual gigs in an year-long quest to play every corner of Vermont. All that and more as World News Tonight starts right now. This is... Ava Derna, World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here's Vinuth Warnasuriya. A very good evening and thank you for joining us on World News Tonight. To kick off the bulletin with the latest updates across the world for this Monday, we begin with some regional updates over in Indonesia. Former Military General Prabowo Subianto is sworn in as Indonesia's president as he announced the country's largest cabinet since the 1960s. The 73-year-old who had been docked by allegations of human rights abuse for decades was inaugurated as the country's eighth president. This spells the end of an era under former leader Jokowi Dodo, known locally as Jokowi, who presided over a decade of economic growth and infrastructure development. Having failed twice to become president, Prabowo finally clawed his way to the highest office after winning over 58% of the vote in February's elections against two rivals. Prabowo was sworn in with his running mate Gibran Rakabom Raka, Jokowi's eldest son. More than 30 leaders attended the inauguration, including British Foreign Minister Minister David Lamy, Chinese Vice President Han Zheng, Philippine President Ferdinand Marcos Jr. and Singapore's Prime Minister Lawrence Wong. He named 48 ministers and 58 vice ministers in his new cabinet, compared with, it, with 34 ministers and 30 vice ministers under Jokowi. They were officially sworn in this afternoon. Some observers believe Prabowo's cabinet makeup, with 17 of the 48 ministers reappointed from Jokowi's cabinet, was a political reward to his predecessor, whose tacit support is said to have propelled Prabowo's electoral victory. The reappointments include that of Finance Minister Sri Mulyani Indravati and Chief Economic Minister Ayadlanga Hatato. According to experts, it seems that Prabowo wants to repay those who supported him politically rather than prioritising institutional reforms. A bloated cabinet can complicate bureaucracy and lengthen the policy-making process, adding that reorganising the different ministries would also be resource-intensive. The process would be a lot in the sense that it's not just the money spent as well as the energy. Some see the lineup as a sign of policy continuity in Southeast Asia's largest economy. Political scientist Burhanuddin Muhatadi said that the reappointments also show that Prabowo does not want to take further risks. Further adding, he said that it is why he chose key figures that served under Jokowi. Prabowo had promised during his campaign to continue Jokowi's developments and infrastructure-focused policies. In his inauguration speech, Prabowo vowed to eradicate corruption, poverty and said he would be president for all Indonesians. The president expressed in a fiery speech that lasted almost an hour that they must always realise that a free nation is where the people are free and that they must be freed of fear, poverty, hunger, ignorance, oppression and suffering. On the foreign policy front, he affirmed Indonesia's long-standing policy of non-alignment, where the country does not ally itself with major power blocs. He said that they would stand against all colonialism and they would defend the interests of oppressed people worldwide. Meanwhile, many Cubans waited in anguish as electricity on the much of the island had yet to be restored in days after an island-wide blackout. The concerns were raised as Hurricane Oscar's first made landfall in the southeastern Bahamas and then slammed into Cuba's coast. Cuba is a country in crisis. At least 10 million across the communist nation without power for the second time in 24 hours after one of the island's major power plants failed on Friday. The blackout putting angry residents closer to the brink of catastrophe amid repression and already growing shortages of clean water fuel and food because there is no one who can stand this says this visibly frustrated resident regime officials blaming the problem on aging crumbling infrastructure already the source of regular rolling blackouts across the island and on a shortage of fuel imports the outrage pouring on the street with chants of we want electricity the government declaring an emergency shutdown in a last-ditch effort to conserve what little energy was left 
Cuba's president has vowed there won't be any rest until the power is back on. But a new hurricane on the horizon, expected to hit Cuba tomorrow, could only deepen this disaster. Ukraine is seeking a stronger reaction to North Korean involvement in the Ukraine crisis, with President Vladimir Zelensky raising the alarm that greater involvement by Pyongyang could be harmful for everyone. Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky called for the international community to take a tougher stance against North Korea amid continued speculation that it will become more involved in Russia's war against Ukraine. In a video address on Sunday, Zelensky cited satellite imagery and video evidence, suggesting that North Korea is not only supplying Russia with equipment, but also sending troops to the front lines. He said that he was grateful to leaders who acknowledged Pyongyang's involvement and expects a normal, honest, strong reaction from allies. The Ukrainian president further warned that greater North Korean involvement would be detrimental to everyone should its troops become trained for modern warfare. Mexico's Navy has arrested 23 people in its largest ever drug bust, seizing some 8.4 metric tons of drugs off the country's southwestern Pacific coast. Mexico Secretariat of the Navy stated on Friday that the bus represents the largest amount of drugs seized in a maritime operation unprecedented in history and that the confiscated goods were valued at around 105 million US dollars. The Mexican Navy also said it had seized some 9,000 litres of fuel and six boats off the coast of Lazaro Cardenas and that the distribution of drugs in the small boats and one submersible vessel required com complex action. The largest drug bust in Mexico's history was 23 tons of Colombian cocaine in 2007. Well, let's go in for a short commercial break. More world news coming right after this. On the road to the White House tonight, former President Donald Trump is focusing on Pennsylvania, making three stops in the battleground. With the fast-changing political dynamics, both the nominees now consider Pennsylvania a must-win. Tonight, Donald Trump speeding through the must-win state of Pennsylvania. I just want to thank everybody. I think we're going to do really well. With 16 days to go, stopping by McDonald's, pushing unsubstantiated claims that Vice President Kamala Harris lied about working at the fast food chain in college and Trump not committing to respecting the 2024 election results. On Saturday in Latrobe, Pennsylvania, Trump's campaign said his speech would focus on their closing message. Instead, he spent more than 10 minutes talking about golf legend Arnold Palmer, who was born in the city, and how he looked in the shower. On stage, Trump also attacked Harris in vulgar and profane terms. Tonight, Vice President Harris pushing back. U.S. officials are investigating a possible classified intelligence leak after documents appeared online purportedly analyzing potential Israeli plans for a retaliatory strike on Iran. The documents, which cannot independently verify, contain markings which indicate they originated from the U.S. intelligence agency that collects and analyzes satellite imagery and apparently shows specific details about the types and number of missiles Israel may be readying for a large-scale strike against Iran in retaliation for Iran launching nearly 200 ballistic missiles at Israel earlier this month. It comes as Israel escalates its operation in northern Gaza, airstrikes flattening this area overnight, killing at least 87 people, according to the Hamas-run health ministry. Children treated in hospital and today an IDF colonel killed in the fighting. This IDF reservist speaking out. Mikhail Ofezir telling us the war and human suffering in Gaza will only lead to more violence. Updating you on the war in Gaza now. Israel has carried out more airstrikes in Beirut and southern Lebanon, including worn branches of a bank linked to both Hezbollah. The Israeli military is continuing its offensives in Gaza, despite the death of Hamas's leader Yahya Sinwar. According to the Gaza Health Ministry, at least 87 people were killed by an Israeli airstrike in northern Gaza on Sunday. The ministry said 40 civilians were among the dead. 
However, the Israeli military says while it's confirming the exact number of casualties, its initial investigation shows that Hamas has exaggerated the figures. It added that the military is trying to avoid causing harm to civilians. Meanwhile, Israeli Defense Minister Yoav Gallant announced on Sunday that Israeli attacks targeting pro-Iranian militant group Hezbollah in southern Lebanon are intensifying. He added that the IDF has been successful so far in not only defeating its enemy, but also destroying areas that Hezbollah had tried to use to launch airstrikes against Israel. Over the weekend, a drone was launched toward the residence of Israel's leader Benjamin Netanyahu in what he described as an assassination attempt. According to Netanyahu, the assassination attempt on him and his wife by Hezbollah was a grave mistake and he vowed to continue fighting. The Israeli Prime Minister also spoke with former President Donald Trump on Saturday, where he emphasized that while Israel takes into account the issues Washington raises, it will be his country that will ultimately make the decisions based on its national interests. Thousands of protesters also took to the streets of Tel Aviv on Saturday, calling on the Israeli leader to sign a ceasefire deal that would lead to the release of the Israeli hostages. Relatives of hostages also took part in the protest, saying negotiations were long overdue. It's believed that 101 Israeli hostages are still being held captive by Hamas since the October 7, 2023 attack that sparked the current war in the region. In what investigators are calling a catastrophic failure of a Georgia ferry dock gangway, at least seven people died and several more were hurt. This morning, at least seven people dead after part of a dock for ferries collapses in Georgia. Among the dead, a chaplain for the State Department of Natural Resources, which operates the dock and the ferries that shuttle people between the island and mainland. Crowds had gathered for a fall celebration by the island's community of slave descendants when the gangway collapsed. Emergency crews using boats equipped with sonar and helicopters to attempt to rescue people who fell into the water. Busloads of survivors taken to a nearby church where they waited to reunite with family members. A wave of bad weather has ravaged parts of Italy and central France with storms and heavy rainfall expected to batter Italy's south until tomorrow. The regions hit by this week's torrential rains are rarely flooded. The water is now receding, but residents are still stunned by the amounts of rain that fell in their town and the risks they faced only hours ago. This business owner, his employees and clients were trapped in his store. Rivers burst their banks, roads and railway tracks were covered with muddy water. More than six months of rain fell in two days. On Friday, Prime Minister Michel Barnier called to improve natural disaster management through more EU cooperation. Homes and infrastructures were damaged. Insufficient planning led to animals being swept away. The water is now receding. Experts are beginning to assess the damages, with residents and professionals saying they will show solidarity and face the crisis together. Some updates on the tech world now. TikTok owner ByteDance says it has sacked an intern for maliciously interfering with the training of one of its artificial intelligence models. It comes after reports about the incident spread over the weekend on social media. The Chinese technology giant Douobao ChatGPT-like generative AI model is the country's most popular AI chatbot. ByteDance said in a statement that the individual was an intern with the advertising technology team and has no experience with the AI lab. Their social media profile and some media reports contain inaccuracies. The company added that its commercial online operations, including its large language AI models, were unaffected by the intern's actions. ByteDance also denied reports that the incident caused more than $10 million of damage by disrupting an AI training system made up of thousands of powerful graphics processing units. Aside from firing the person, ByteDance said it had informed the intern's university and industry bodies about the incident. ByteDance operates some of the world's most popular social media apps, including TikTok, and its Chinese equivalent, Douyin. It's widely seen as a leader when it comes to algorithm development due to how appealing its apps are to users. Like many of its peers in China and around the world, the social media giant is investing heavily in AI. It uses the technology to power its doorbell chatbot as well as many other applications, including a text-to-video tool called Gmail. 
Divert into Australia now, King Charles III and Queen Camilla landed in Sydney as they began their official tour of Australia. Meanwhile, an indigenous senator interrupted King Charles' visit to the Parliament House in Canberra, launching a tirade about genocide and land rights during proceedings in the Great Hall. Basking in the Sydney sunshine, Australia says g'day to the King and Queen. This is what they travelled 16,000 kilometres for. Shaking hands with all generations. From every corner of Australia. G'day, you've actually great each from Tasmania. For one Adelaide student, it took a 6am flight to make this moment a reality. Okay, guys, we'll have a bit more space for the class. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Scotch Scotch in Adelaide. A shout out to Mrs Grave who asked me to wear my uniform if you're watching this. The King even spotting his old polo coach among the church crowd. Well he's Prince Philip, his father said to me will you help the boy many years ago and I said of course I'll help the boy and the boy is now King. The monarch ignoring protesters before making his way into the heart of the city to address a parliamentary gathering. Outside, His Majesty found himself among the masses. A warm reception the King and Queen hopes will be repeated in Canberra today. It's going for a short commercial break. More world news coming on the other side. Welcome back. And finally tonight, David Feuchtseit, an award-winning music professor at the University of Vermont, is on a mission to perform piano concerts in every single city and town in the Green Mountain State. His mission is about to bring a change in the climate crisis by uniting people together to the healing sounds of music. This fall, in a place known for maple syrup, sweet sounds too. Music in the Green Mountain State from David Feuerzeig's piano. He's an award-winning music professor at the University of Vermont who's performed around the world. His stage now, every single one of Vermont's more than 250 towns. It's a project he started two years ago called Play Every Town. David, sometimes even getting a little extra help to get his piano where he's got to go. I also like to localize the programs a bit more than that. These free concerts are a mission, he says, to focus on the environment. So far, he's performed in nearly 70 towns across the state, with sights set on every single one over the next few years. Near his hometown of Huntington, a warm welcome. A duet with his wife, Annalise and donations to help the state rebound from recent floods. And he's got groupies, yeah, groupies, following his journey who wouldn't miss it for the world. A one-man symphony hitting nature's notes. And with that, we mark the end of the first bulletin of World News for this week. We'll see you again tomorrow with some more updates across the globe. Well, stay tuned as we've got Anwar Vikram Singh joining you next on the Night Trip Business Report. Thank you for watching. Have a good night.